Hello, today is Saturday, May 2nd, 2015, and I am your host, Sue Brown, and welcome to Info to Rail, your freight train to modern media. How are you guys all doing today? I just want to start off by telling you I'm in downtown Canada, and it is a beautiful 65 degree sunshiny day. So it's awesome, awesome to be with you guys and share this day with you. We have a great show for you today. We're very fortunate to have popular writer of history, archaeology, and science Andrew Collins with us today. It's going to be a very fascinating interview. First, we're going to take a little glimpse into the missing persons files. We have one from Knoxville, Tennessee, girl missing in Illinois. Brittany Horn, age 16, was last seen 4 20 2015 in the 3700 block of South Indiana and the Bronzeville neighborhood of the south side of Chicago, Illinois. She is five foot, four inches tall. She weighs 130 pounds, has brown eyes and black hair that she dyes frequently. She wears glasses, and she was last seen wearing a lime green sweatshirt, gray jeans, and a black and white gym shoes. She suffers from bipolar disorder and depression that requires medication, and she may be in need of immediate medical attention. Please, you guys, anyone with any information on her location, please contact the Area Central Detectives at 312-747-8380 or dial your 911 in your area. Her case number is H is in Henry, Y is in yellow, 229 Five six seven. Okay, our next one is Abby Russell, age 24, was last seen in Stillwater, Minnesota, near her home in the 1700 block of North Broadway, Highway 95. This was early Saturday morning, April 25th, 2015. Her family is from Fall Creek, Wisconsin. She just moved to Minnesota on April 4th. After work on Friday, she had a few drinks with her Pub 112 co-workers. Just before she was last seen, she was on the phone with a close friend in Wisconsin. Her friend asked Abby to hang on, and she'd call her right back. Police said right after the call is when she left on foot. She left behind her purse, her car, her phone, and her beloved dog, Oliver. Abby is 5 foot 7 inches tall. She weighs 150 pounds with shoulder length brown hair. She has a large tattoo of flowers and feathers that wrap around her upper right arm down to her elbow. She also has a tattoo of a single black flower on her left forearm and written words under her left armpit. Abby has a pierced nose and pierced ears. Please, you guys, anyone with any information on our location, please contact the Stillwater Police Department at 651-351-4900 or dial 911. I can't express how important this is, not only to me, but to especially to those families out there who are missing their people. You know, we've got to band together, even if we're in a grocery store or in a department store, you know, look around at the people that are around you. And, you know, when you're out and about and you're driving down the street, take a glance into the cars around you. You know, I'm going to, I post everybody I talk about, all my missing persons, I post them on our website. It's just go to uh, info to rail Google sites. I post a picture of each person that I, each missing person that I talk about every week. So please, take the time to go on there and take a look at their pictures and take a look around. Let's bring these people home. Well, right now we're going to take a short break, and when we return, we will have Andrew Collins with us. Stay tuned. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Okay, we are back with Andrew Collins. Andrew is a popular writer of history, archaeology, and science. For over 30 years, he's explored the relationship between archaic religious beliefs and the cosmos, examining the origins of human civilization, the development of of technology, and the inspiration behind magic and religion. His discoveries have led to several thought-provoking books that challenge the way we think about the past, including From the Ashes of Angels and Gateway to Atlantis. He also, the organizer of the Questing Conference, 
Britain's premier event on alternative history, forbidden archaeology, and ancient wisdom. Welcome to Info to Real, Andrew, and thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Um, first, can you start off by telling our listeners about you and what you got you into your many fascinating studies? Um, yes, I can. Um, I suppose it really began when I was a uh, child. Um, I had the strange fasc fascination with um, the mysteries of life. Um, and But at the time, I was more sort of mechanically orientated. I had interests in things like trains and aircraft and things like that. And then one night, as I was laying in bed, I saw this bright light pass um, uh, in the frame of the, the window. And um, I took it to be a UFO, uh, which it may or may not have been. And it galvanized my interest in trying to understand the UFO mystery. Um, so I, I talked to friends about, you know, flying saucers and the idea of life on other worlds. Um, I gorged as many pulp paperbacks as I possibly could, of which there were dozens and dozens available at that time. And um, eventually I, I felt that I wanted to get closer to the, the intelligences behind the UFO phenomena. So the only way that I could do that was to join the British UFO Research Association and become an investigator. So I started to investigate people that had had um, encounters with UFOs. And this led me to investigate a number of, of very important cases, uh, including a whole family that had been uh, seemingly abducted, um, complete with car, uh, aboard a UFO or some kind of, of, of strange object after they witnessed um, this oval-shaped blue light. Um, and then the car headlights went out, the car uh, engine failed, and they ploughed into what they described as a luminous bank of green mist or fog or gas or something like this. And when they got home, they found that three hours were missing from their lives. Now, this was the first case of its kind in the UK. And I got um, the, um, the British UFO Research Association to organise hypnosis. And an on-board experience was revealed. Um, and, but the strange thing was is that the, the people concerned, um, most particularly the, the, the male of the family, whose name was John Day, found that after the, the case, the, he, he felt this connection with the intelligences behind the, 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 the UFO encounter. Um, and, if, and he started to relay information about not just who they were, but their contact in the past with humanity, you know, places like, um, you know, ancient Egypt and the Pyramid Age, uh, uh, Avebury and the megalithic complexes of, 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 of England, um, you know, suggesting that these, these beings, these entities have been around for thousands of years helping humanity um, and that also he started receiving information about new technologies you know, ion drives and different types of, of quite futuristic, um, you know, sort of uh, inventions that some of which went on to be, you know, um, standard in many years to come after this, this encounter. By the way, this took place in 1974 and I first met them in 1977 when they reported the case for the first time. And I think this, this really changed my life. I mean, because it, it brought me into contact with what I perceived as, as extraterrestrial intelligences uh, for the first time. Um, and I continued to investigate many of these cases. But over, as the years went by, I began to realize that this simplistic view that UFOs were nuts and bolts spacecraft coming from another planet, you know, with flesh and blood aliens in them, was inadequate to explain what was truly going on um, and I began to realize that firstly the witnesses were just as important as the actual phenomena that was observed and there was a connection between certain types of people and this phenomena which for the most part was balls of light or light forms or objects that would then evolve during the experience into something more tangible um, and would reveal 
you know, entities um, or occupants that, that would manifest, you know, from the, these objects and connect with the people. And if the people got too close, not only would they have strange electromagnetic or electrostatic effects, you know, experienced by themselves or witnessed in the environment around them, but that suddenly, you know, that, that, that there would be like a sort of wobble of reality, something that UFO investigator um, uh, Jenny Randall refers to as the Oz factor, you know, that, 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 that reality starts melting, basically, and that the people are then taken into almost what you might describe as out of normal space time to experience something like, an onboard experience or an abduction, as you would call it. Um, and I started looking into the nature of UFOs and began to realize that they almost always seem to be manifestations of an energy that's known as plasma. Now, plasma is the false state of matter. Um, it's also uh, something that, that we find quite commonly in things like um, plasma TVs, lightning, uh, the northern lights, the sun itself is mostly plasma, stars are plasma. Indeed, out in space, probably 90% of the, re of, of the physical universe is actually this thing called plasma. Um, so the fact that there seems to be this relationship between human consciousness and manifestations of UFOs in this medium of plasma seemed of great interest to me, and I wrote various books about it, the latest being some, uh, a book called Light Quest, which came out in 2012. And I believe that this is the way forward in trying to understand what the UFO phenomena is about, that it's not simply about nuts and bolts spacecraft, it's about interacting with um, multidimensional energies and intelligences that coexist with us and have done for many, many thousands of years. What do you think the intention of these uh, beings is to our race? Um, I think that a lot of it is to do with evolution. Um, I think that they have coexisted with biological life for uh, many, many thousands of years, possibly tens, hundreds, even millions of years, um, and that they are universal, that they're... They, they're not terrestrial. In other words, they're, they're not purely of the earth. They're not necessarily extraterrestrial in the sense that they've arrived from another planet. I think that they are um, universal in the sense that they operate, the intelligences are outside of normal space time. In other words, they exist on a quantum level, a subatomic level, uh, in a manner which we don't quite understand uh, in science yet and that they manifest into our own dimensions of space and time using portals or gateways which um, are manifest within this medium of, uh, of plasma, um, and that therefore they can temporarily, temporarily exist within our world, but within a very short space of time, be it minutes, you know, the, the, the longest probably with hours, they have to return into this state that existed before their appearance into our own reality. Uh, and this is why I think it's been very difficult for us to, um, to pin down the nature of the, unif of the UFO phenomena for so long. But going back to your original question of what they're doing, I think that there is a curiosity. I think it's about observation. I think it's about evolution. I think it's about helping us. I think it is about directing um, humanity in certain directions but as I said this is not necessarily involving flesh and blood aliens I, I, I don't know whether they exist in all honesty most of the evidence that I have seen the good evidence from UFO uh, encounters and UFO sightings seems to point towards something a much more intangible much more multi-dimensional or trans-dimensional in nature um, but having said this these intelligences can exist here, but at the next minute they might be on Alpha Centauri or they might be interacting with the ancient Egyptians, you know, or the peoples who built Avebury in England or Stonehenge. Um, they operate outside of normal space time. Do you think that 
their intentions are good towards us, or do you think that there are certain races of them that are evil? Um, I think evil is probably a, a very materialistic um, and very human term. Um, I don't think we'd fully understand, you know, the nature of these intelligences to say whether they're good or evil or what their motivations are. But I think that generally they're of benefit to humanity. But I think that just like within the human race where we have good and bad people, I think that some of these um, these intelligences, the way they manifest, the way they interact with us, can cause us to see them as as evil or bad in some way. So I think it's a bit of both. But I don't necessarily think we're talking about different races. I think that these intelligences are all part of, of a whole. They're a part of a universal intelligence. Now, where what their origins are, I don't know. It may well be that they were originally flesh and blood beings that existed on some planet elsewhere, perhaps even on Earth, who knows, and that they may have achieved some kind of ascension where they no longer needed physical bodies and are now essentially pure beings of, of energy. They have no obvious form. The form that they take is something that is moulded through interaction with consciousness, consciousness of ourselves or any other types of um, flesh and blood, you know, carbon-based life that, that they encounter uh, in the universe. You know, in other words, what we see is essentially of our making. You know, we choose to see them as, you know, as greys or, you know, as tall Nordics or as, you know, multi-head uh, legged things or whatever. That's, that's the way that we interact with this phenomena. But equally, in the past, I think people saw them as the fairies and the goblins and, and angels, uh, maybe gods and demons. And going right the way back to Paleolithic times, we would have seen them in terms of supernatural creatures, power animals, um, or a even ancestor spirits. Um, this is the way that our, 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 the, our ancestors interacted with them. But all the time, as we know from things like the Bible, accounts in, you know, Roman, um, you know, texts or texts from other places around the world, we know that this phenomena has been with us, you know, for thousands of years. Uh, and this cannot be denied. And, but I think that what we have to be careful is our interpretation. Too many UFO organisations um, and individuals have an agenda, an agenda where they want to see everything as flesh and blood, as part of some kind of um, of of a, a social collective view that we see them in terms of the greys, that they're the saviors of humanity, they're going to be fighting the reptilians, um, and that th this is something that's virtually a belief system which we have created, and I think we have to be very very careful when we do this because you know you have to be careful what you wish because sometimes your dreams can trump come true or even your nightmares and i certainly don't want reptilian aliens turning up on my door basically <laughs> right um a lot of people are coming forward and saying that they're being abducted and they're taking sperm and ovum and stuff from from these men and women do you believe that that's really happening i have no idea I mean, obviously, I, I like you, uh, read um, these reports or you see television programs that, that, that claim that it's happening. What I can say is that the UFO abduction experience, the onboard experience, is real. There's no question about that whatsoever. I think it's been occurring in various forms across human history. But I think what's important is that just a few hundred years ago, those same abduction experiences um, occurred and were known as fairy encounters or, or fairy abductions. Uh, what would happen is that a, you know, a person would, would, would be, let's say, walking across a field home and they would see a bright light. They would walk towards it. The closer they got, they would see you know, fairies dancing uh, in a circle. They would join them. They would enter inside their house. And I use that word. Um, in quote marks um, and you know they would continue to dance with the fairies they may eat something and they would come out and hours or days or possibly even years would be missing from their lives now the same thing happens on onboard experiences today 
But I believe that a lot of what people uh, experience is almost of their making. It's almost like what we expect to happen does happen. And that could be the worst that we expect. And I think that we need to be re-educated about our interactions with this phenomena. You know, we need to know that we govern exactly the way that it turns out. Because when you enter into these, I would say, um, transdimensional environments, which are outside of normal space time, our interaction with the phenomena and the intelligence is total. So if we expect something horrible or horrendous um, or biological to happen to us, it will happen. Whereas if we were to settle down and experience these things um, on a much more one-to-one communion level, I think that this sort of thing wouldn't happen and that whether or not sperm is being taken, you know, um, human creatures or animals are being kept in some kind of lab- laboratory and, and, this is, and humanity is just some kind of, you know, animals in some massive alien farm as part of a harvest. I don't like believing that. I'm sorry. I think that we need to be aware that we are interacting with intelligences that have been with us for thousands of years and these experiences can be much more beneficial, much nicer, um, and that if we see them in terms of transdimensional entities and, and intelligences, what I call the light intelligences, um, I think that we can encourage them to appear, we can encourage interaction, we can encourage communication and communion with them on, you know, on, on a, a one-to-one level, and I think that humanity will benefit much better from this type of experience. With all of these planets in our universe, uh, to me it kind of seems like if there's life on Earth, wouldn't it seem kind of rational that there would be life on these other planets as well? I think that the universe is teeming with life. Um, I think that there may even be life on certainly some of the moons in our own solar system. Uh, What type of life that is, whether it's microscopic or... Um, you know, or macroscopic in the sense of, uh, you know, creatures that have evolved to, um, you know, in the environments that that, that exist on these places, I don't know. Um, But the one thing I can say is that, as Carl Sagan, you know, the great astronomer and scientist said, that the distances between one star and another are so vast that unless we do create something like warp drives, then we are not necessarily going to be looking at contact with these uh, extraterrestrials for a very very long time indeed and the thing is that other intelligences other types of um, beings that exist in the universe out there in our own galaxy for instance must also be aware of this and I think that somehow there is an easier way of contact now whether this is through the use of portals or gateways, if you like, stargates, or whether it is a mental process. Now, what I mean by that is that our reality is basically, um, you know, the standard model of, of, of the universe. In other words, our reality is pretty well fixed. But obviously, we know about the existence of the quantum world, the subatomic world. Now, that operates outside of normal space time but it interacts with the physical world and through essentially the connection with consciousness i think through the actual presence of life i mean we know that within quantum experiments that the the consciousness of the observer can change the change the outcome of experiments now that means that consciousness has a major role in the creation of physical reality but beyond that is the subatomic world, the, the quantum world. And that has no boundaries as far as, as, as distance or time. You know, we know that, um, that particles have twins and that when you affect one twin, the other twin moves in a similar manner. And it doesn't matter how far away it gets. It can go to the opposite side of the universe. And if you think that 
these particles are infinite in amounts, then essentially the same dances that might be going on in our own head can be going on in the heads of, of, of aliens on other planets. In other words, the idea of cross-communication, what you might call telepathy or even mind over matter, I think is probably easy across incredible distances of space. So what I'm getting at here is that sometimes what we refer to as divine inspiration, you know, or acceleration of evolution could be caused through interaction with intelligences, extraterrestrial intelligences that exist on the other side of our own galaxy. They may be affecting us, that the way that we appear, how our entire DNA may be influenced and affected by the way that we interact with these other intelligences out there at a distance. In other words, the idea of them sending an actual nuts and bolts spacecraft from one place to another almost becomes infertile once you achieve this type of communion, this type of, of mind connection over such wide spaces and distances of time. You know, and I, and I think that within a very short period of time, humanity itself will have essentially uploaded its own consciousness into machines, um, you know, flesh and blood beings like ourselves will no longer be needed. You know, the age of the Terminator will come one day. There's no question of that. It might take 500 years. It might take 1,000 years. It might take 10,000 years, but it will happen. And the idea that we can then transfer consciousness into some kind of energy form becomes the next step. And I think that there are many different um, cultures, races, um, that have done this already out there in the universe and that we're more likely to be in touch with them than we are um, races that are of a similar stage in evolution to ourselves here. In other words, I don't think necessarily that extraterrestrials are coming here in rockets and, and spaceships that are held together with nuts and bolts. It, it doesn't seem sensible to suggest that. And I think that a lot of evidence that's presented to us um, by, you know, those that believe in the ancient aliens theory falls short of, of backing up or verifying the claims that they're making. I'm not saying that we have never been visited by physical extraterrestrial races. I think it's, it, it probably has happened at the, in the past at some point. There are too many stories from around the world that talk about the gods coming down from the sky world to earth and then returning back to the sky world. Sometimes they even come in vehicles, you know, in, in flying boats, um, you know, in discs and shields and things like this. It is possible that that communication has happened in the past, but I think that its effect upon human evolution may not have been as strong as some people like to believe. I think that it's more likely that any effects on the acceleration of, hum of e human evolution has been through mind contact through other intelligences. I'm very fascinated by the forbidden legacy of the fallen race and the Book of Enoch and such and how that all comes together. Can you tell us your outlook on that? Well, the, the book that I think you're referring to there is my book called um, From the Ashes of Angels. Yes. Um, and this was about the um, the human-like angels that are talked about in the Book of Enoch and other similar um, Hebrew texts that, that date back to about you know two three hundred BC of these these beings known as the Watchers. Now the Watchers are said to have uh, descended uh, from heaven to earth and mingled with mortal kind, that they took wives, they revealed to their wives the um, arts and sciences of heaven, which, to be honest, sound very much like the firsts of humanity uh, about five to 10,000 years ago in the Near East. Um, and that because of this, humanity accelerated too quickly. The watchers were punished for, you know, the, the rebel watchers were punished for doing this. 
and incarcerated. Um, and it was said that the children that were produced through this union with mortal women, the so-called Nephilim, were rounded up and uh, killed. Now, this is the way that it's presented to us, and it's seen almost as an extension as the by, of, of the Bible stories relating to the so-called sons of God coming unto the daughters of man and producing the, the, you know, the, the mighty men, the giants of the earth, um, who were known as Nephilim, um, and that you know, they were all destroyed in, in the upcoming flood. Um, now, there's, there's, this is the, the religious idea of the Watchers, but if you look more closely at the Watchers, uh, it talks about them having cloaks of feathers. It talks about them being extremely tall, with long faces, piercing eyes. Um, often it's said that, that they have um, hair that is that you know uh, as white uh, that, that that is as white as snow, um, and it's also talked about the fact that they can fly in the the, the sky like an eagle or a bird, um, and obviously they can produce uh, you know what appear to be flesh and blood offspring. Uh, they can sit down, they can eat, um, and the more that I read this, <coughs> excuse me, the, the more I started to realize that you're probably talking about the memory of human beings, little different to you and I. And then I looked at where they're supposed to have lived. And heaven was actually associated with a mountain range. Now, traditionally, this is seen as Mount Hermon. Uh, right on the northern borders of Israel um, and Lebanon. However, earlier accounts of the Watchers talk about the, this mountain range being in the vicinity of what is today eastern Anatolia, um, the Republic of Turkey. Um, and this is where the traditional Garden of Eden was. And indeed, the earliest stories of the, the book of Genesis were all played out in this area. Uh, not only that the presence of Adam and Eve um, and the early so-called antediluvian patriarchs down to Enoch, the writer of the so-called book of Enoch, but also Noah um, and the flood itself. Noah's ark is said to have come to rest um, in, in the area very close to the Garden of Eden um, in eastern Turkey. And it becomes clear that a lot of these early stories were born in what is today Eastern Turkey. This was the traditional Garden of Eden, the cradle of civilization. And what do we find in this area? Evidence of an extreme high culture existing 12,000 years ago, constructing this stone or megalithic complex known as Gobekli Tepe, which consists of a whole series of circular or ovoid uh, stone circles, many of them with carvings of animals, many of them um, anthropomorphic or human-like in appearance with T-shaped uh, capitals, T-shaped uh, tops to, to the stones. And, and some of the stones show figures that are clearly well in advance of the hunter-gatherers that were said to have existed at this time, just before the the moment that we changed from being hunter-gatherers into more settled farmers, something that, that may well be connected with what was going on at Gobekli Tepe. Um, and something big was going on here. This place is almost certainly evidence of a lost civilization, one that existed during the time of the last ice age um, and the remnants of which survived a cataclysm that took place just prior to the construction of Gobekli Tepe and seems to have involved a comet impact that devastated the planet, plunged the world into a period of darkness, um, caused the re-advance of the ice sheets that had been slowly receding for thousands of years um, and also caused other types of destruction, probably even is remembered in the story of the destruction of Atlantis as given to us by the philosopher Plato. 
around 350 BC. Um, all of this was going on in the world just prior to the emergence of Gobekli Tepe. So who constructed Gobekli Tepe? Well, the the best evidence seems to suggest that it was a um, an, a power elite, as what the archaeologists call them, that emerged in this area, probably having arrived here from the north, um, around 10,000, 9,500 BC. Um, and the best evidence seems to suggest that they match the appearance that's given to us of the watchers. They were extremely tall. They had very long faces, extended jaws, high cheekbones. Um, they had very powerful eyes. They may well have actually been um, hybrids. And I don't mean alien hybrids. I mean hybrids of Neanderthals, which were our distant cousins that was supposedly um, went extinct around 30,000 uh, years ago. But they, before their extinction, um, uh, mated with our own ancestors, uh, the, the Homo sapiens, and created hybrids with a different mindset to, to, um, to, to everybody else. And that the remnants of them, I think, were behind the construction of Gobekli Tepe and were these human-like angels these tall, strange-looking beings that are remembered in the Book of Enoch and are also talked about in Sumerian texts. Sumeria was a, um, a city-state or a series of city-states in what is today Iraq, um, which is just below southeast Turkey. Um, and this would seem to have been a, um, uh, a culture that emerged from the, the ashes of places like Gobekli Tepe, uh, which really kick-started civilization that then started springing up in everywhere from ancient Iraq and Syria and Israel, but also in Egypt, as we know, uh, and as far away as the Indus Valley in India. So this is what the Watchers are. They are the founders of civilization, um, and they founded places like Gobekli Tepe and probably various other uh, megalithic complexes around the world which we're still in, you know, looking for now and are beginning to, uh, to, you know, to, to become aware of their existence um, because of this knowledge of this greater antiquity of civilization going back to the end of the last ice age. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your book, The Gateway to Atlantis? Well, we talked about Plato's idea of uh, Atlantis itself, and he was the first that sp the first person really to write about this 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 so-called Atlantic island uh, called Atlantis that existed in what he referred to as the Atlantic Sea, um, and it was said that ancient voyagers were able to reach this island by going beyond the so-called Pillars of Hercules. Now, these were rocks that marked the exit to the Medi Mediterranean Sea in Europe. And once in the open sea, or ocean as we would call it today, they then navigated the, the waters and eventually arrived at this, this island empire of Atlantis, which was connected, he said, to the opposite continent, that was a term he used, by a series of smaller islands that were used um, as stepping stones by these, these voyagers. And it was said that around 9,500 years ago, um, Zeus, because Atlantis, the people of Atlantis were getting too haughty, too big for their boots, um, Zeus decided that he would destroy them in a single day and night uh, within earthquakes and floods and that the island of Atlantis sank at this time and that where it had existed was now uh, very shallow waters um, which were very you know difficult to navigate and very dangerous for boats if they tried to um, you know to enter into this area well this is essentially what Plato tells us but other writers from the same period talk about this same uh, area of shallow waters which were very dangerous for 
uh, boats and vessels if they reached them that were you know somewhere towards the west but what they additionally state is that these waters were covered in seaweed and this tells us exactly where he was talking about and this is the so-called Sargasso Sea this is the massive area of seaweed that stretches for hundreds of miles from the mid-Atlantic Ocean right the way across to the very edges of the Bahamas. And the Bahamas, of course, is the area that is very, very shallow, very dangerous for, for, for deep-sea boats. And it seemed as if this was where Plato was referring to. But, of course, how is it possible that ancient voyagers could have reached this area. Well, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that, that as far back as maybe 1000 BC, maybe even 2000 BC, that voyagers from the Phoenician nation in the Lebanon and Syria, um, and possibly um, those from their, their, their neighbouring cultures who they founded in Iberia, um, which is today Spain, uh, and also on the north coast of Africa, the so-called Carthaginian uh, nation, were travelling west across the Atlantic Ocean and reaching the Bahamas and using these as stepping stones to reach this opposite continent, which was not, as most people seem to have believed at the time, East Asia, but of course, the American continent itself. And also, when you reach, um, when, if you travel over using the, um, the, the currents from uh, North Africa, they will eventually bring you to the Caribbeans. And you then use the islands of the Lesser Antilles to reach the northeast shoulder of South America. So this is exactly what Plato seems to have been referring to. However, his description of the main island of Atlantis actually seems to match very closely the biggest of the islands of the Caribbean, and that's Cuba. Uh, everything that he says about the island seems to fit it, the, the dimensions, the plains, the winds, um, and this is somewhere that I began to realise was probably the flagship of Atlantis, and that the Bahamas were the remnants of the sunken kingdom of Atlantis. In other words, there was a certain amount of confusion in what knowledge actually filtered back into the Mediterranean world that Plato lived in. And he created his story based on these ideas that were coming back into his world, probably from Phoenician and Carthaginian um, vessels, or the crews um, on these vessels that that were coming into port speaking about these places that they were encountering in the West, which, by the way, don't normally go under the name Atlantis. They, they go under the name of, of the Hesperides, the islands of the setting sun. Um, for instance, in one account, it said that the Hesperides could be reached in what I believe was about 40, 40 days um, of, you know, of, of, of constant sailing. Well, that is almost exactly the amount of time it took Columbus to reach the uh, Lesser Antilles, um, I think on his third journey, suggesting that the Hesperides was somewhere in the vicinity of the Caribbean islands. So I have no doubt whatsoever that the ancient mariners at the time of Plato were actually reaching the Caribbeans. But also we know that these islands retain stories of ancient catastrophes that sound very much like the effects of a comet impact. Uh, for instance, after Columbus uh, landed on Cuba um, and obviously other um, early Europeans uh, began to colonise these islands, the islanders talked about a time when all of the islands were together as one landmass and that at a time when the sky went dark or the moon fell from the sky um, or the waters rose up twice, uh, they were broken apart into the manner that they are seen today. 
uh, and these stories were brought back into Europe and are written down, were written down by Spanish chroniclers uh, and can still be read. And, and all of these accounts I give in the book Gateway to Atlantis, which will be republished uh, within the next year. I hope you don't mind discussing a few different topics of your work. All of it interests me. Um, can you tell our listeners about the Cygnus mystery? Yes. Um, all around the world, peoples believed that our souls came from the stars, that this is where they came from before birth, that they were brought into incarnation to this world, often by a bird um, of, or through the actions of a shaman going into what was known as the sky world and bringing the souls to earth or, or I say earth, I mean into physical manifestation. But it was said also that the soul would return back to whence it came at death. And I'll give you a good example of this. In the United States, there are literally dozens of different tribes who have the same death journey. Um, it is said that at the point of death, the soul leaves the body and eventually makes a journey west to the, to, um, the edge of these great waters. And at certain times of year, the constellation of, Cygna, uh, sorry, of, of Orion is present there and that they make this leap of faith towards one of the objects in Orion um, known as Messier 42, M42, which is a nebula in the sword of Orion. And once they reach this gateway, this portal known as an Ogi, they then go onto the Milky Way and they then travel around the Milky Way to a point where they meet this figure, usually referred to as a bird-headed individual. And here the soul is judged. If it is judged righteous, it is allowed to cross over this log bridge into the afterlife proper. And if it is judged to be of sin, it will go on the short course to oblivion. And we know that this, this fork on the Milky Way is the exact position of the constellation of Cygnus, the celestial bird um, or celestial swan, and that this was seen, this fork in the Milky Way was seen as the point of entry and exit absolutely into the sky world. And this is found universally all over the world, not simply in North America, but also amongst the Maya and the Olmecs of Central America, um, amongst the, the Inca and the pre-Inca of Peru, uh, amongst the, the, the Indian, um, the East Indian peoples of, of Asia, uh, in Europe, amongst the megalithic cultures, many of the, the uh, stone circles such as Avebury, but also uh, the passage graves of, of, of Newgrange in Ireland, uh, the stone circle of Cannon, Cullinish in Scotland, uh, and many more similar places are all aligned to the brightest star in Cygnus, which is known as Deneb. Uh, and even in Egypt, the three pyramids that sit upon the plateau of Giza um, are in exact um, geographical or astronomical positions of the so-called wing stars of Cygnus. Um, and the, the reason why Cygnus was so important in Egypt is that it was believed that the pharaoh was an incarnation of the god Re or the god Horus, um, and that in death the, the soul of the pharaoh, who had now taken the form of Osiris, the god of the underworld or the god of the dead, would return back to the womb of his mother. And that mother's name was Nuit, the sky goddess, who's often depicted in ancient Egyptian uh, art as this naked lady um, over the, the, the earth represented by the god Geb. Um, and 
the pharaoh would have to return back to her womb. Now, Nuit is a manifestation of the Milky Way, and her womb is in the exact position of the folk of the Milky Way and the stars of Cygnus. So the pharaoh saw his return journey to the womb of Nuit as entering into the sky world via probably Orion, uh, which my colleague um, Robert Bouval has talked about uh, in connection with the, the pyramid builders. And they would then journey uh, along the Milky Way, reaching the womb of, um, of, um, of Nuit, and then being reborn and being born through the legs of Nuit, which is the twin streams created by this folk in the Milky Way. Um, and then his rebirth would be seen on the horizon as the rise of the sun itself, the embodiment of the god Re, the sun god. Um, do you believe that the myths that we call myths today, such as centaurs, mermaids, you know, all these myths that we hear today, um, for some reason, I believe that there's truth to those myths. I think that these things did exist once back in the day. Do you believe that? Um, mermaids and centaurs, probably not, in my opinion. I, th I think that if we were ever to find um, some kind of anatomical evidence to suggest they existed, we could take the matter further. But I think that what myths are, they are ways of explaining things which are difficult for what were more primitive peoples to actually understand. And that we create uh, images, we create um, settings which help us to preserve ancient knowledge and ancient wisdom across an extremely long period of time. Um, and that this is necessary because you've got to remember that in the past, everything was passed down orally for probably thousands and thousands of years. There were only certain cultures that had uh, written forms of writing and even less cultures actually wrote down their, their, their myths and their traditions or their history in some kind of, of recordable form. So you had these orators, these bards, um, possibly even shamans or certainly storytellers that had to convey these ideas uh, from generation to generation, almost word perfect, um, and that many of these traditions still are preserved amongst the peoples of, let's say, Polynesia or Melanesia, where these stories are still retold by them. And this is the only way that they can convey this information um, in kernels that can be... Um, that can be understood and interpreted by those that have a greater understanding of them, you know, um, I mean, whether within their own communities or even outside of their communities. So I think that it, that it, it's, you have to look at myths as important, but they are conveying information, but going right the way back to Paleolithic times, let's say 10 to 20,000 years ago, there was an absolute firm belief in the importance of supernatural creatures that occupied either the underworld or the sky world. Um, and both of these concepts were essentially the manner that they, they understood and could accept the fact that there was some kind of invisible world that coexisted within ours. And within that, all sorts of creatures, some of them, um, you know, sort of um, combinations of, of human and animal that were there to represent aspects of nature or aspects of um, uh, interaction with, 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 with the human race. Um, they believed in power animals. They believed in the supernatural creatures that uh, enabled them to more easily uh, be able to interpret things like cataclysms, um, or strange omens in the sky, like you know the appearance of of comets and meteors, you know, or even more mundane phenomena like um, lightning and thunder and things like this. You know, many 
of these early cultures had to understand these things by interpreting them in terms of supernatural forces. This might seem quite primitive to us today, but it was the best way that they could handle them in the past. And, it, and, and, and even now, there are many cultures, many indigenous cultures that still have these views around the world. So that's the way that I like to interpret myths. I think that they're crucially important. Folklore, myths, stories, they're there to supply us with information about what was going on in the past or the way people interact or perceive natural forces around us. I know that you've had some experience looking for, you know, searching for Atlantis with Greg Little. Um, I wondered if you could share some of those experiences with us. Well, um, after the publication of uh, Gateway to Atlantis in the year 2000 um, and my appearance in 2002 um, as a, a keynote speaker at the, um, the ARES, at the Edgar Casey Foundation's uh, conference in Virginia Beach, um, it, it galvanized um, Greg and Laura Little, uh, my very good friends, um, uh, of whom I'm actually staying with at this, this very time uh, in, uh, uh, in the USA. Uh, it galvanized them into checking out on site a lot of the stories that had originally come about in the, the, the late 60s and the 70s relating to the existence of various uh, Bohemian islands of underwater ruins such as the, the Bimini Road um, and other circular features or rectangular features that had been reported in different books and that I had catalogued at the end of my own book Gateway to Atlantis and so they were able to check some of these out obviously like the Bimini Road which we know it exists and, and almost certainly it was probably some kind of harbour um, or key um, and they found other similar structures elsewhere uh, off of Quesel, uh, an island just to the north of, of, of Cuba, uh, and at Andros, uh, this massive platform of uh, rectilinear blocks just beneath the surface, 6 to 12 feet um, under, un, um, you know, in the water itself, this so-called uh, Andros platform, which again probably served as some kind of key um, you know, or uh, dock for vessels uh, at some point in the past. But much deeper, other rectilinear structures have been found off of Andros and off of Bimini, um, one of the, the, the smallest um, islands, one of the closest ones actually to the, the, the coast of Florida. Um, and bit by bit, they've, they've created a, a, a picture of the existence of archaeological ruins that probably date back from around 2000 BC right the way back to 10,000 BC, the very age that Plato tells us that Atlantis was destroyed. So we can say that almost certainly the Bahamas and almost certainly the, Baha uh, the, the Caribbean islands, like Cuba, which is just to the south of the Bahamas, were occupied at this time and that the peoples did experience some kind of cataclysm. Probably many of them were killed. Uh, most of them would probably, if they'd have survived, would have gone to the mainland, probably uh, the northeast coast of uh, South America um, or Central America or Florida. There's lots of legends about people arriving in Florida after a cataclysm. Um, and then probably they would have migrated back to these islands at a later point. Uh, and this is the view that, that, that Greg and Laura take today and that I also uh, believe in. But of course, this is not what the archaeologists tell us. As far as they're concerned, nobody lived on the Bahamas at all until about 600 AD. In other words, about 1400 years ago, which is just ridiculous. Um, and this is just... Uh, another example of the archaeologists being unwilling to see a much bigger picture in, you know, in, 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 in our vision of the past. I, when I had talked to Greg Little, he was talking about the coral that was at the bottom. Um, 
that you couldn't that you know was was illegal to dig through. Um, do you? And I asked him the same question. Do you believe that that coral that is illegal to dig through is going to be a factor in you know it's going to be a negative thing in in finding Atlantis? Well, the simple answer to that, of course, is yes. Uh, the, the coral builds up very gradually over hundreds and thousands of years and will um, impede any investigation of uh, stone structures um, which exist at the bottom of, of the sea. But I, I think that we have to look at this from the point of view of obtaining evidence that's going to convince the archaeological community. I mean, it's easy for myself and yourself you know, and your listeners just to accept the existence of these structures, the existence of Atlantis, um, and indeed other cultures around the world where their cities or their towns were drowned um, at some point in the distant past. However, for all of this to stand, we have to involve the archaeological community. They have to embrace this evidence. And for that, you've got to get official permits, official permission to actually do any kind of exploration or excavation of these sites. And particularly in the Bahamas, um, at, the mo at the moment, it's becoming more and more difficult for archaeologists, uh, underwater archaeologists, uh, to work there uh, due to certain problems that they had with uh, treasure salvers stealing um, Spanish gold and things like this from wrecks. They have made the uh, the bureaucracy involved with it now is awful, and it is preventing any further work into what could be, you know, the discoveries of the century uh, that we know are ready out there to be looked at right now, including um, the uh, the ruins which. Um, were discovered recently and have become known as, as Brown's Ruins, which is this mass of stone blocks um, which uh, have been found uh, some distance off of Bimini, which could easily be the remnants of a built structure that was absolutely devastated during some kind of cataclysm, perhaps as, as much as 10,000 years ago. But nothing can be done, and it, it's pointless trying to um, get upset about this or trying to uh, push it forward in ways which uh, are illegal because you know we have to abide by the 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 laws of you know the the the, the, the bohemian islands you know we can't go against that if if we want to do this property properly um, and we just have to accept that that is the situation at the moment is there any technology that can help you see um, what's underneath there? Oh, there's loads of technology. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, with the exploration of the Titanic, for instance, uh, so much technology was was actually created simply for that purpose that it's now being taken on to be used in in many other fields and, and areas of, of 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 expertise. You know, there are there is radar. You know, there's obviously remote operated um, video cameras which are becoming more and more uh, sophisticated. They can go to greater and greater depths. Plus, obviously, we can use, um, you know, submersed tiles, mini submarines, and things like that. Um, the, all of these can, can, can be used, but all of them can only be used with the permission of the governments of the islands uh, concerned, as I say, particularly the Bahamas. Um, I do believe now that Cuba, which I see as the flagship of Atlantis, the fact that that's opening up um, to Amer American citizens now, that you would you find that you you will discover a large number of ruins off of the the um, you know the coasts uh, of the um, the island itself. Now, I mean, I propose, for instance, that you would uh, discover. Uh, ruins off of the southwest coast of Cuba in the book and within a year uh, ruins had been discovered not far from this very area uh, and this was big news uh, in 2001 
Uh, in fact, a lot of people patted me on the back and said, you know, well done, well, well done Andrew, for, for pointing out this area because you, you may well be correct. But unfortunately, um, the people that had found the ruins, um, a company called ADC um, Communications of Canada, uh, got, began to get very greedy over the rights um, to explore this site. Um, and they'd never got the money that they wanted and just disappeared into the night and have gone back to tre treasure salving, which was their, their original uh, employment. So uh, the, the, the whole story went under. But um, yes, I mean, they, they, of course, there, there is a lot of technology that can be used today, but there's nothing like getting on site and doing it, um, you know, w with, you know with, with actual one-to-one -one contact with, with the place. Is there a way to be able to see through the coral down under the ground? Uh, I don't. I honestly don't know. I mean, I suppose the answer is it depends how thick it is, and um, I think you would need to, uh, you know, to remove a certain amount of coral just to actually examine the rocks. But I mean, what is it we're actually looking for here? I mean, we know that the that the stone blocks are there. What you're looking for for the most part, is dating evidence or evidence of human activity going back to some greater age. You, you'd be looking for stone tools. Um, you're looking for stone points uh, and, and any other evidence that you can find, datable evidence that's found beneath stone blocks that would, or between stone blocks would be better that suggest an absolute age for these structures. Uh, that's what we really, really need. And, and that probably wouldn't involve too much removal of coral, I wouldn't have thought. Do you think that one day uh, you'll get the permissions that you need in your lifetime to be able to find out? Um, well, you know, my colleagues at the moment um, have all of the paperwork um, ready with the, the Bohemian government. Um, and it's just a case of when they put it through. But it's so much red tape it could take five it could even take 10 years that and that's the honest truth of it at the moment uh, I mean there are many archaeologists working off the coasts of Florida for instance uh, and they have find they have found lots of evidence um, of ancient cultures existing as far back as 10 15 thousand um, years ago uh, so it, it's it's the foreign governments that, that are, are more difficult to deal with. But I would encourage more work in the area of Cuba myself. I think that's where a lot of discoveries are going to be made in the next few decades. Um, can you give us again your, the names of all your books and where uh, our listeners can purchase these books? Indeed. Yeah, my most recent book was uh, Gobekli Tepe, Genesis of the Gods, which... Uh, shows that uh, Gobekli Tepe was, um, you know, the, the place of the foundation of civilization. I answer the questions, who built it, when and why, and also its impact uh, upon later civilizations and religious books like the Book of Enoch and the Bible and Mesopotamian texts. Um, plus uh, the Cygnus mystery, which we've talked about, that came out in 2006, uh, from the Ashes of Angels, which is, was my first look at the Watchers as human beings existing in the Garden of Eden, uh, eastern Turkey, probably at the end of the last Ice Age. Uh, and I contributed material to Greg Little's most recent book, which was uh, The Path of Souls, you know, the, the, the Native American death journey um, and its involvement with this, this, this ori our, our soul's origins. Uh, in the stars, um, in connection with the constellations of Cygnus and Orion. Um, I think that's probably it. And, of course, Gateway to Atlantis. I mean, all these are available uh, via Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Um, and if you can't get them from there and you want to buy them directly from me, uh, I've got my own uh, store on my website, which is www.andrewcollins.com, which um, you can... Uh, contact me through. Uh, there's a, there's a, an emailer there that you can use, or find me on Facebook, just Andrew Collins author, and I'll come up there and I'll be happy to hear from any of your listeners. And and one thing I will just add from a commercial point of view, we we do uh, tours 
uh, to many ancient sites around the world. So if you want to go to Gebekli Tepe uh, in either May or in September this year, uh, look at the website www.andrewcollins.com or if you want to go to Peru and Bolivia in June with myself, uh, my colleague uh, Hugh Newman uh, and Peruvian uh, expert Brian Foister, uh, all of the details are on the website as well. Uh, and watch out for further, you know, tours for next year. That is fabulous. Um, this is all so interesting to me because this is stuff that I've been interested in since I was a kid myself. Um, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to to come on here and and talk to us about all this. You know, and and I'd love to have you back on here when you know you you do more and and you have more information for us because this is this is amazing. This could be the biggest breakthrough. Thank you. I'll, I'll happily come back. Absolutely. Um, I mean, I've got a new book that I've got to write over the winter period, which at the moment is being called Hybrid Origins, and it's basically um, about the impact that hybridize or hybridization between different types of early humans um, have had upon uh, the rise of civilization from about 50,000 years ago to the uh, emergence of Gebekli Tepe 10,000 years ago um, and that will be out in 2016 so I'll probably come back and talk to you then if that's okay. That would be absolutely great. Thank you so so much for your time. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> That was an amazing interview, you guys. This stuff to me is so fascinating. I've always been interested in Atlantis and, uh, you know, the stuff with the Bible, the Nephilim, the angels, all of this. This is so fascinating to me. And every time I do one of these amazing interviews, I learn so much more. And I'm hoping that you guys do, too. Um, that's all we have time for today. And we post all our shows on YouTube. And if you want to know more about our guests and our upcoming shows, please visit our Info to Rail webpage. You can just Google Info to Rail and click our Google Sites page. Um, from there, you can go to our YouTube page. Um, I want to thank you guys. And I can't thank you enough for joining us here each and every week. And we really hope that you guys continue to come back every week. We have some absolutely amazing guests coming uh, in the near future, as well as the amazing guests we've already had. Um, please, you know, you guys are amazing, and your support means so much to me. And I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, may God bless you and keep you, and may his face shine upon you in these uncertain times. We'll see you soon.